like.
You know their life, you know what they need, you know the struggles, so Lord, I pray that you go and be more than their everything. Fill the void, Lord, of life. Lord, today I pray for those that may, may have a, a, their cup up right and it's just being overflowed this morning. Father, you know their hearts and, and they're rejoicing in your name today. Father, I pray that you do good works in their life and, and spark a fire and fan that flame that's, that's blowing in their souls this morning to, to live for you in a deeper and much richer, richer and much more meaningful way that they came in this room. Today. So, Father, today, you are God. You are big. Help us not put you in a box this morning. Church, will you pray and just tell God what it is you, you expect Him to do in your heart today? Ask Him to challenge you. Ask Him to make you new. Ask Him to, to fill a void. And Father, we want to pray for the loss of our country, the loss of our world, the loss of our workplaces, those who are far from you. Lord, let, let us be your tool. Use us as your avenue, Lord, to bring freedom and salvation. So, Lord, we pray this in your name today. Excited to know what it is you're going to do. We give you all the praise and all the honor. Lord, be glorified.
here visiting, we welcome you today if you have no obligation to give. But as members of the this church, this is the way we worship the Lord because the way our offerings and our tithes work, it pays the bills and, uh, and it takes the gospel to places where the gospel needs to go. Amen? And uh, so you give gracefully, you give generously, you give joyfully, as the Bible says, and uh, God will do his thing. So give in just knowing that God is going to use the gift that you give today. So Father, today we worship you. And this is our act of worship. It's a spiritual act, Lord, that we give to you today. So Lord, we pray that these dollars that are given uh, with a joyful heart and a joyful spirit will be used by you and be multiplied. And only you can multiply it. Turn it into something good. Bring light into the darkness and let people be known. That they can know you. Your name. Amen.
the right video that would capture uh, alabaster. And uh, you know what? Um, I can't find one. So um, if you have something, those of you that are Nazarene to the core, uh, you have something that, that says, hey, this is what we do as a church. Uh, will you like send that to me? Because I think we do a horrible job as a denomination. I can't find one. I can find one if I fell asleep actually watching it. So uh, that's not the one I want. So that's what you're going to send me. Just keep it, okay? I've already seen it. Um, but, uh, but we want to collect over the next five weeks alabaster money. It's above and beyond our tithe, above and beyond our, our offering. It's the loose change that rolls around in your car floor, right? You understand? Or when you empty your, like, if you're like me, you, you know, put your pants in the laundry and the change falls out on the floor, pick it up, put it in alabaster. Okay? Um, just, just do that. So however you collect change and collect it, we'll, uh, we'll send it off to our, our missionaries and it'll be a good, good way to um, build churches. Debt free uh, is what we do. So uh, so you give. That would, I'm going to try to have a video next week for you. Don't hold me to it, but I'm going to try. So, um, and then update on Pastor Michael. Uh, you have this uh, bulletin for you. Just pull this out real quick, will you? Um, there's some key information in here that I need. Uh, you to see because uh, some of you, you just take it, you don't read it, and before you know it, you've collected like a year's worth and you haven't read anything on it. So I want you to read today, uh, there on the front, uh, how we want to support uh, Pastor Michael and Claudia at Harper. Uh, today is their last Sunday at their church, so they're a train wreck right now with emotion. Um, it is, if you've ever uh, moved away from friends, you kind of know what it is, but as a pastor, you got like your congregation, people that you love, uh, say goodbye, it's tough. Um, it's really hard, hard to do. But they're going to, Michael thinks he's going to put everything in a 20 foot U haul. You have to put a foot to it this week. Like, Seriously. It's okay. So 20 foot is going to show up on, on Saturday um, as they start their journey this Wednesday uh, and arrive on Saturday sometime in the afternoon. If you want to be involved in how to help unload this thing, uh, we're going to post it once we get a closer timeline on our website or on the app. It'll go out in uh, an email, it'll go out on the prayer chain, it'll go out on uh, our e-newsletter. There's lots of ways you can find out what happens at Her Nest, but we're going to push it to you this week uh, so you can come and you can help. If it's 20 foot and we have like a bunch of people, we'll be done in 10 minutes. Okay? You know that's not true, but it sounds good. Alright? So you can come and help them. But on this list, we want to come next week with the old time mentality of a food pounding. You ever have a food pounding? You know what that is? I I've been amazed how many people don't know what a food pounding is. It's basically, you go shopping, right, for this list, or add to it, and then you bring it, and then we're going to put it all over the ministry center, and we're going to, like, make them store food for the next year in their garage, okay? Because that's what the church does, right? We want to support them, because in 24, they're not bringing food, right? And please, um, don't do what they did to us one year. They did a food pounding for us, and they removed every label. <laughs>
fabulous job of decorating back here. If you haven't seen it, I don't know how you missed it. But we need to have you back to sign up on how you can be part of serving our community. We have so many people in our community that come that are far from God or serve other gods or, or just they just don't have any idea who Jesus even is. Um, this is an opportunity for us to, to be light. Uh, so if you can go back and sign up for there, there's a way to sign up online on the website. It's on our, our, our church app. Uh, we're back there. Uh, you can sign up. That would be great. Some of you already have. We already have some of you that have been using the app. You've been sending some things in. So thank you for that. Uh, we have your registrations. But there's also five trash cans of candy that we need. Now, this has been mathematically calculated. Okay? Um, I should get how many gallons, Gabriel? Do you remember? 100. We need 100. What? 110. We need 110 gallons of candy just to keep from running out. Okay? So that means, church, we need us to all come together and every time you go to the store, don't leave them a bag of candy or 10 bags of candy, right? And then bring them and dump them off the trash can so that we can have, have enough to really love our, our community in that way. Um, so Simon, great. The goal is 20 vehicles, 20 trunks. And I had somebody say, well, my trunk just isn't worthy of, of uh, outreach. Really? Clean it, okay? Make it worthy. If not, put up a canopy. Just come. Uh, we'll give you a car space. Just decorate. Do it. You don't even need a car. So just come. And we'll put you in there. So the idea is not your trunk. The idea is you serving. We get that? Yes? Ever say amen? Amen. Yes, we get that. All right. Um, then, just around the corner after that, and it's served day in November. And then in December, it's Christmas, we all know, but it's our adopted family ministry. And uh, so things just happen. So are you buckled in? You're ready? It's going to be excellent this fall. So um, if you be praying for us as a church, we get into everything that is going to happen. If you're not involved, I just gave you, like, I filled your whole life, okay? So find a place and, uh, and serve. Well, have you ever had the feeling of uh, going to God and saying, God, um, pick me. Pick me. Uh, I kind of tend to go like, God, don't pick me. Uh, maybe you have that feeling. It's like, God, don't, don't pick me for that. Please don't. Please don't pick me for that. You ever said that? Seriously, I five of you with me, okay? God, don't pick me for that. But really, what would, it, what would it look like if we would just go to God and say, God, pick me. Choose me. See, he already has. It's just we have to humble ourselves and go, God, here, I really want to do this. We don't because we're, we're in the fear mode of we're not worthy. Okay, I mean, think back, way back for some of you, but in PE class, gym class at school, when they're picking teams, what do they do? You're a captain, you're a captain, pick your teams, and they go one by one. And if you're like me, I wasn't first, wasn't second, I was pretty close to the bottom barrel. And man, my self-esteem, I did not like gym class for that reason. You know, I was like, man, I'm going to be the last. And I was kind of on the bigger side of life as a kid. And I would have thought for Doc, I would have been number one. Because I would block everything. No, no, because I couldn't run, couldn't bend over, couldn't, I didn't have a real good arm, throwing arm. Yeah, I was like bottom barrel. But you know what happened? I started blocking people. And I'm like, I'm good at something. And then I learned the rules of the game. One hit, you're out. Maybe that's why nobody picks me. But see, I start going up my mind all these reasons why. Why am I not worthy? Why am I not picked? Anybody ever, you know what I'm saying? You know what? But see, I grew up in that day, and I lived through it. You can't do that with kids anymore these days, right? No, 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 no. I don't hurt anybody's feeling. Listen, I was hurt. I was kicked. I was abused. I mean, that was like, that was not fun. That was bullying in my back in my day. Right? And uh, just gym class, just did not like gym class. In fact, I failed gym class in high school. That's a whole different sermon illustration. I'll give you something. <laughs> but <laughs> how do you fail gym class in high school? It can't be done, you say. What I want you to do, though, is remember today when you leave here that, uh, that I want us to be thinking about things that we never really, really think about. Of, Man, God, if you would just pick me, just pick me. See, because too often we focus so much on our, our attention on the reasons that God can't possibly pick us. I'm not good enough. I don't smell right. I don't look right. I've got too many issues and problems and, and whatever's in my life. Surely God. And we forget that we have to keep our eyes on the Creator and not on the creation. 
right? But what would it look like if Jesus would look us square in the face and say, you're right, you're not worthy. You're not worthy. But I still choose you. I don't choose you because you're cute. I don't choose you because you've been born in the church. I don't choose you because you love your enemy. I don't choose you because you feed the poor and the homeless. I choose you because you are you. What if Jesus, what, what if that concept, we really grab a hold of that concept? Well, that's exactly what I want to talk about this morning. That's exactly what Jesus did. Um, he gives us 12 illustrations, 12 examples of what happens when Jesus looks at somebody and says, you're not worthy, but I still choose you. So, so if you came into this room, on this camp, and you're like, man, I just don't think God's got a plan for me. I just don't think God is, like, worthy. You know what? Today is your day, right? To look and go, man, I'm not worthy, but he still chooses me. Now, we've preached that we have purpose, we have plan. We've preached lately that our job is to know Jesus and then to make him known. But today, moving in a little different direction, man, what if we actually get the concept in our heart that we are chosen because we are loved? I mean, we sang about it, but we have this fear in us that, mm -mm, not even good enough. Not smart enough to hold the Bible inside and out. But here's what Jesus did. I want us to go back to the Last Supper. Now, the Last Supper, we're not going to celebrate communion today. We're going to have communion next Sunday. But this Sunday, I want us to spend the entire week, my challenge to you, is thinking about what we're going to talk about today. So that the next Sunday when you come into worship, you are ready in a different relationship. You're in a different spot. You maybe move closer to God than you have in the past. To where you can celebrate next week with communion and go, mm -hmm, I get it. I'm not worthy, but I'm loved. I'm not worthy, but I've been chosen. Right? So, so that's, where, that's where we look at where Jesus is with these 12 men. He surrounds himself with 12 men who are very mixed up, dysfunctional guys. They're not perfect in any way. And what Jesus says it, it, is they come to my room, let's sit at the table, and the Bible says that he took the cup and he passed it to them and he says, drink from it, all of you. So all of you is a pretty key point. Even after knowing everything the disciples have done and everything the disciples are going to do to fail Jesus in the future, Jesus still says, you all come, you all sit, and you all drink, all of you. No matter how great your shortcomings are, I still choose you. I mean, no matter how shortcomings I, no matter how many shortcomings I have, God still uses me, right? He still chooses me. Your shortcomings, and it's not a short joke, right? But your shortcomings, y'all know you have shortcomings. Jesus says, I'm still choosing you. And that's where he's at here. He gives us 12 examples, 12 disciples, okay? We want to go through them uh, quickly this morning. I'm not going to delay around being one of them. There's a lot of other disciples we don't know. But I want to just kind of glean from them a little bit of their life, and maybe even a little bit of what we don't know, and look at the man. Do we really understand, or do we remember how mixed up these guys were, and where God still says, I chose you, and they helped change the world. Amen? Amen. All right, here we go. Some of them are so far away from God, and they're so mixed up, that they couldn't even go into a temple to worship. Now, it seems like from time to time, our culture is pushing us more and more toward, you know, the anti-Christianity and, and anti-God and anti-everything that has anything to do with morals and values and ethics of the church. But there are people that are told, you cannot go to the temple to worship. Matthew was one of them. Matthew's a tax collector. I mean, Matthew is the guy that rips people off. Now, some of you here should say, all of us have our own opinion about the IRS, right? Everybody had the same opinion about the tax collector back in, in this day, where Matthew was, where Jesus was. And, uh, and Matthew, man, he's a work in progress. I mean, he has not arrived anywhere. He's just, he's just a ball of human flesh that's regarded by everybody as scum of the earth. Now, I don't know if you've ever been made to feel like you're like the scum of the earth. 
But uh, Matthew, his career, his job, just naturally put him there. You're just like, scum, not worthy. Do not build the temple because nobody wants you here. Hmm. Have we ever told anybody that? No, we don't even want you in church. I mean, we may not physically say that, but maybe we do with our actions and attitudes and relationships. But, um, but they actually tell him physically, no, no, you are not worthy. Matthew chapter 9, verse 9. Jesus went on from there. The on from there part is Jesus just healed uh, a paralytic. Um, he's just done a miraculous healing. People are watching. The disciples are, are present for all that. And, and, or so the people are, are all present for that. And they're watching this. And then Jesus saw, the Bible says, he saw a man, and his name was Matthew, sitting at the tax, tax collector's booth. Jesus said, follow me. And Matthew got up, and he followed him. I mean, it makes it sound pretty easy to do. But I want you to notice where Matthew was when Jesus called him. Matthew, when Jesus called him, he wasn't called after he left the tax booth. He wasn't called after he changed careers. Matthew was sitting at his tax collector's booth. And I'll just get the picture. There's a line of people in front of him. And he's got his scroll out. And he's got his, his, his stamp. And, and he's just going down the list. And he's making everybody uneasy. He's making everybody unhappy. He's probably overcharging some. He's probably stealing from some. I mean, that's what tax collectors do. And here's Jesus going to Matthew and going, hey, listen, you're right in the middle of sin, and right now, I want you. I choose you. Come and follow me. Maybe he's saying that in front of you this morning. Now, right in the middle of your sin and your disaster, you know what you did on Friday night. You know what you did on Saturday night. You know how you're living outside of this room. And maybe Jesus is going to say, hey, 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 I choose you. That's what he does to Matthew. I mean, they saw what happens. And also, people look at Jesus going, like, wait a minute, who is this guy? <laughs> Nobody is Matthew's friend. But no, this one man, Jesus, goes into friends. And the second one is this, two or three, it's James and John. Oh, man. These guys, they are so progressive in thought. I know progressive is politically not a really good term these days unless you're on that side. But, but he, they are so progressive. They are so forward in thinking. They are, they are so untamed in their tongue that they get the nickname, the Bible says in, Matt, in Mark chapter 3, as the sons of thunder. You see that? They're the sons of thunder. I mean, that would be a good tattoo, Anthony. The sons of thunder, right there, buddy. Put it anywhere you want to. Right? We should get the sons of thunder tattoos, the rub-on things. Right? And just, man, it just, I mean, put some flames on there, I can see it. Right? It's like, sons of thunder. I mean, these two guys, they, they, are, they are so eager to serve. Bible says that their tongues are untamed. They are out there. They, they speak before they talk. They're ready to put hurt on anybody. Jesus says, put hurt on. They're ready to love anybody. Jesus says, love. And sometimes they just want to take things in their own hands and just run with it. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. Don't get ahead of me. Luke chapter 9, look what it says. Luke chapter 9, 54. When the disciples, James and John, saw this, and the this, they just saw Jesus do some great things. They just saw Jesus uh, release demons from this young boy. They just saw this, this, this person get, get healed from being demon possessed. And the people are mad because they see Jesus heal people. They see him deliver people. They see Jesus do miraculous things. They don't understand who Jesus is yet, but they understand enough about him that he is something that they want, that they're looking for. And they're mad because Jesus is packed up his caravan, and he's ready to leave town. So that's the, that's the this. When the disciples saw this, crowd of people coming because they're angry because Jesus is going to j -town. He's moving on to Jerusalem. They asked, Lord, here's these sons of thunder, Lord, do you want us to call out a fire from heaven and destroy them? <laughs> Have you ever had anybody come to you and you just know they're mad at you? Right? Lord, thunder, lightning, fire. Do it. Do it. You ever want to do that? I, mean, I have days like that just like, Lord, fire, right now. Right? right? I mean, that, that's what these guys are, are thinking. Jesus turned to them. Look what Jesus does. Jesus rebuked them. 
Notice that even after Jesus turns to them and rebukes them, look what happens. He corrects their stinking thinking, and then he and his disciples went on to another village. We live in a culture that does not like correction. It's almost becoming a hate crime to correct anybody in their training, uh, in their train of thought. But Jesus, he didn't take these guys and go, oh, hold on, hold on. Don't be praying for the fire yet to destroy them. Let's, let's love them. They don't understand what we're doing. So, no. Now, I'm sure sons of thunder, they're full of energy. Just, they got to be. I'm sure they're kind of licking their wounds a little. They're probably a little frustrated going, man, just let me out. Just let me out. <laughs> but look what Jesus does. He doesn't throw them by the wayside. He doesn't treat them as roadkill. He doesn't go and find two new guys to take their place because they disagree with him. Right? He says, no, we're not doing that, but we're going to move on. And what did the boys do? They got in line, and they followed. They didn't quit while well, he hurt my feelings. No! They moved on, the Bible says. You can read through all kinds of accounts of the sons of thunder and how they, they changed lives. Fourth one is this. James, uh, son of uh, uh, Alphaeus. We don't know what he did. We don't know what his trade is. He wasn't really a fisherman. Uh, doesn't say that anyway. He's probably a tradesman uh, by trade. But with his hands, he's able to communicate. He's able to, to raise funds for his family. But James is so overshadowed by other people that we never really get to know much about him. And we just kind of see him in the background sometimes. He's listed in, in some list of things. There's James and then there's James. And we're like, well, there's two James. Yeah, there's two James. But we don't really know much about him. And yet, Jesus, the King of Kings, pits the overshadowed. You ever feel like you're just kind of like in the shadows? You ever feel like you never notice? You ever feel like nobody even cares about you? You're just a name on a list? Or you're a name behind a number? If you're not even a name anymore, maybe you're just a number? And the King of Kings goes and says, James, nobody knows you, but I want you. I choose you. And then, next one, number five. Always puts his foot in his mouth. Peter. Yep, Peter. Peter's that guy that, that, that he just, no matter what the guy does, he's always questioning Jesus. He's always questioning Jesus. Jesus, why are you doing this? Jesus, why are you doing that? Jesus, why are we going here? Jesus, why is there anything to eat? Jesus, why can't you do that? Those of you who have kids, that famous question of why, why, why? Right? That's Peter. Peter's always asking the question, always calling Jesus into question, not understanding what Jesus is, is all about. Even right down to the very end, in this scene of the upper room, where the disciples are gathered right before the Passover, Jesus calls them together in John chapter 13. And it shows us that Peter, even here at the end, He's even cursing here at the end. Even when Jesus goes and washes his feet. Look what it says. He says, he came to Simon Peter, Jesus, came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus replied, well, you don't realize now what I'm going to do, but later you're going to understand a whole bunch of things. And Peter replies, no, 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 you're not going to wash my you shall never wash my feet, Lord. You see, washing the feet was, was ceremonial. It was, it was customary. You come into the house, those of you didn't know that, that the host, they would wash their guests' feet. It was a sign of, of, of respect and honor. And it's a way to serve. Hey, you've been on the road. It's been a long journey. And man, let's just serve you. It'd be nice if I came to serve your house and I just got a little full run. Just say it. Just throw it out there. Pass the appreciation month. Mm -hmm. But yeah. <laughs> just, I'm totally kidding on that. <laughs> Matthew chapter 26 tells us that even after Jesus died on the cross, while Jesus was still hanging on the cross, Peter once again puts his foot in his mouth. So it says, it's a little while later. After a little while. After Jesus had died, still there, the crowds are all still around, they're kind of mumbling, some of them dispersed, it's dark, 
Hear what it says. After a little while, those standing there went up to Peter and they said, Surely you are one of them. Your accent gives you away. I love that. It's not his dress, right? Not his little robe that they wear, right? It wasn't, it wasn't anything that he had on. It wasn't his hair. His nice and comb hair. It wasn't any of that. It wasn't how he smelled. It was his talk. It was his speak. So obviously, Peter is flapping at the lips about something. We don't know what the something is, but we know that this horrific thing that Jesus just did on the cross, Peter does not understand. And he's there in the shadows and he's talking to people about it. And his accent gives him away. You ever pick people up on their accent? A lot of times you're wrong, aren't you? At least I am. And it's not, it's not where I thought you were wrong. But these people, they knew that, no, surely you've got to be one of them because, you know, it's your accent that gives you away. Then they began, then he began to call down curses. This is a holy man of God. This is the guy that traveled with Jesus, one of Jesus' closest friends, and he's now cursing, and he swore to the people. He swore to the people, I do not know the man. I don't know him. And then we have the Easter rooster show up, and he grows. And yet, down the road, Jesus comes alongside Peter and says, Peter, do you love me? Uh, yeah, I do. Good. Let's go. Let's go. I'm using you. I choose you. Maybe some of you denied Christ. Maybe it was last Monday. Maybe it was last Sunday afternoon. We got 11.32 last week. Maybe at 11.33. You're already like, yep, Jesus, no, don't buy it. And maybe you've lived that week all, all, that way all week long. And what I'm telling you this morning is that Jesus, even though you've done that, still says, I choose you. And I can use you. Number six, Thomas. Man, do I love Thomas. You love Thomas? Thomas is like a man after my own heart. Doubts everything. <laughs> he is just the biggest doubter there ever was, ever created. I mean, he struggled to have faith in things that he could not control, have faith in things that he could not touch, or smell, or taste. Thomas was, well, oh, I doubt it. <laughs> nah, it's not going to work. Man, we, we can raise money to hire a youth and worship pastor. I doubt it. <laughs> well, I think we have enough chocolate to have 500 or 600 people come on our campus and have a great celebration for Jesus and be light in the dark. I don't think so. But we've done it before. Yeah, not very well. That's why they Thomas need, right? And we have some of those Thomases. But in John chapter 20, Thomas is here and he's like, I need physical proof that Jesus is who Jesus said he was. I need physical proof that Jesus has and is risen from the dead. Look what it says. Thomas, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came the first time to the house. So the other disciples told him, hey, we have seen the Lord. But Thomas said to them, listen, guys, unless I see the marks in his hands and I put my finger where the nails were and I put my hand into his size, I will not believe. He doesn't say, well, I don't know if it really, if it really happened. I, I, I don't know. I, you guys, I don't know if that's really the right way to think. No, he says, I will not believe that. I will not believe that. These guys, these ladies that were in this presence, they were his closest comrades. They were his best friends. They cried together. They journeyed together. They did life together. They had good days and bad days. They fought together. Right? They had disagreements together. They had love come and heal those, those, those disagreements. If there's anybody Thomas should have, have enough faith in to know that they're telling them the truth, it should be these people in this room. And he said, nah, I'm not going to believe any of you. None of you. I mean, that would be almost like Ray Thompson coming to me and, and, and saying, hey man, I, I just, I just got to tell you, God did a miracle in my life. No, he didn't, Ray. No, it didn't happen. It, it'd be like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick it. <laughs> yeah, I picked on somebody last week. That worked out really well, so I'm going to try it again. Okay, Nicole. Okay, I'm going to pick on you this morning. A couple weeks ago, those of you who don't know David and Nicole, but, but Nicole over here, uh, one of her biggest prayer requests has been, for those of you that do journey with, with them, has been that she's been praying for 
test results come back to see if she has cancer. She's told that I, I pretty much have cancer. And we've been praying as a church. And we came the Sunday before the Monday doctor's appointment that was going to say, yes, this is the kind of cancer, here's your treatment. Can I say that? I'll share it with you. So. <laughs> we stood right here, we prayed. So the doctor on Monday. It ain't cancer. <laughs> yeah! But you know where Thomas comes in? If I was a cancer begin with. And he stands there next to his disciple Philip. And he says, Philip, 
Uh, where should we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only, I love this, he asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. See, he's messing with Philip. He's like, okay, Philip, you've seen me, you've, you've listened to me, we've eaten together, you know what I'm capable of. Phil, we're going to buy bread to feed all these people. And look what Philip says in verse 7. It would take more than a half year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have just a bite. I mean, Philip's mindset went just like your mindset a month ago, right to the circumstance, right? Forget that we're standing next to Jesus, who can do anything. We're like, he asked me a question? i got to answer. It's going to be in the Bible someday. Let me answer the question right, right? <laughs> I don't know, but it's going to take a lot of them. Let me do math real quick. So there must be a mathematician somewhere. Because, hey, half a year, one bite. That's all you're going to get, right? And he forgets. And look what Jesus, look what Jesus says. Whoops, I, I turned the page. I should have done that. Okay, well, you don't trust the story, right? He feeds, right? He feeds a lot of people. So, so he feeds a lot of people. And it's because, it's, it's not because Philip, he looks at the circumstance and not the creator anymore. And he's looking at what's in front of him, and he's afraid of all this crowd that's coming toward him. Feed him now. That wasn't part of the plan, Jesus. He forgot that Jesus was capable of doing anything. Amen? Amen. There, I'll move on to the next one. Eight, Andrew. Oh, man, Andrew. Uh, and he's a fisherman. Andrew's just a common guy. He had to be rock solid. I think, I think when you see Andrew in the Bible, you don't, again, you don't see him very much. He didn't get a lot of recognition uh, anywhere. He was never given anywhere in Scripture that we know of. He wasn't given any kind of leadership, right, in front of people. He wasn't ever asked to lead a life group. He wasn't asked to receive the offering. He wasn't asked to serve communion. He wasn't asked to teach a Sunday school class. He wasn't asked to do church membership. He wasn't asked to preach. We just don't see him in any leadership. Yeah, Jesus looked at a common, ordinary, hardworking, everyday guy who fought to feed his family, who fought to, to serve with his brother uh, in a fishing boat. They have a family business together. They're both fishermen, and they're doing the best they can, they can in a very um, hard area where everybody's fishing. I mean, it's, it's a very tight industry there. And, and here's this guy. Jesus looks at him and goes, I want you. You're common. You're common. Maybe no leadership skills, but you're common. And I like you. Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1, verse 16. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net in the lake for their fishermen. And Jesus says, come follow me, and I will send you out to fish for people. Now, when I'm fishing for something that I've never fished for, like, I don't know how to do it. Right? I don't know what weight line, I don't know what lures, I don't know how much weight, I don't know what do you anchor, do you not, do you float, do you drift. I went fishing this week. I fished for salmon for a lot of years, I've caught a lot of salmon. But my mentor, Eric Townsend, <laughs> he came up with a bunch of terms for how to fish for salmon in the Columbia River this week. I had never known. He's using terms, and I'm using terms. We're talking about the same thing, but we are totally messing each other up. My floating was his whatever. I don't even remember now. Drifting. My drifting was his lead whatever. You know, and I'm like, how do we do We had this conversation in the boat. I had no idea how to do that. So he starts talking about what is it? I know exactly how to do that. And that's when Jesus comes along here and he's like, listen. You can do this. You can fish for men. And you're talented and you're capable. And maybe some of us forget that we're talented and capable in what we're good at. God says, use your gifts. If you're not a fisherman, don't fish. If you're not a hunter, don't hunt. If you're not a mathematician, don't try to do multiplication. Right? Hey, listen, my hand, buddy. Listen, use your passion. And Jesus says, you got passion, I can see it in you. You have some characteristics that I choose, and I choose you. Number nine, Bartholomew. I know, like, we're almost like, kind of like time and sermon, can you? Bartholomew. Um, called Nathaniel by, by a lot of the Bible. He was extremely skeptical. Nathaniel was a skeptical man. You ever, you ever 
walk next to a somebody that's skeptical about everything. <laughs> How did they ever get anything done? I mean, I, I've had skeptical people in my life and around me, and sometimes I keep them in close circles because I really never know what they're thinking. Right? And I say, How can you be so skeptical on that? Well, that's Nathaniel. He's very skeptical. John chapter 1. John chapter 1, verse 44. He's very skeptical here about what Jesus did and about just about Jesus himself when he first heard about him. He says, verse 44, Philip, here's our, here's our excited messenger, right? Our excited messenger is now in the, in the scene again. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, they were from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and he told him, Hey, we have found what Moses wrote about in the law and about who the prophets even wrote about. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Look at what Nathanael says. Nazareth? Can anything possibly good come from Nazareth? Okay, that is Nathaniel's one line famous that he's known for, right? I mean, it's just, I mean, somebody put that on banners and bumper stickers and everything. It's part of every Christmas drama or reading that you're reading. The, really? I mean, Nathaniel, really? Nazareth? Did anything possibly come good out of, out of Nazareth? <laughs> what a skeptic. And Jesus says, you know what? I can change that mindset. I choose you. I want you. Number 10. Thaddeus. Thaddeus is also called Judas. So there's two James and there's two Judas. This is not Judas Iscariot. This is Thaddeus. And what we know about Thaddeus is nothing. We don't even know. He's a name on a list. But he's a name on Jesus' list. Which means he's somebody. Right? To the historians and to the historical theologians and to those who read and breathe this stuff, he's like a zero to the historians. He's a name on the list. He's one of the twelve. For whatever reason, nobody knows. We don't know what he did. We don't know if he was married. We don't know if he had family. We don't know anything about him. But we know that Jesus looked at it and said, you know what? You might be a zero to the historian, but to me, you're somebody. You ever feel like you're a zero? You ever feel like you're just not worthy? Some of you grew up in some homes as kids where you were abused. And you were made to feel like, I'm not worthy. God, there's nothing good that I could ever do or accomplish. Some of you have gone through school and people make fun of you. You know, and all of a sudden you're like, man, I'm not, I'm not worthy. Some of you are trying to do something with your gifts, giftings and talents, and somebody comes alongside and just shoots you down again. That nah, just didn't work, did it? That was pretty good. No, nah, that was horrible. You never gone back and tried again. You see, you're zero. You're nowhere in history. You're never going to step out of, uh, of your circle and step out in courage. You're never going to go and, and, and take that step of faith in Christ and go, yeah, you made me. It might be a zero and nobody to historians, but to Christ or somebody. Number 11, Simon. Simon the Zealot, he's known as. <laughs> Those zealots. You know what a zealot is? Oh, man, the passionate people, the zealots. Man, you get a, close to a zealot, you know, you better hang on tight because life is about to change, and it's going to change how you think and how you live and how you respond and how you react because a zealot is a very passionate, driven person. Simon here, the zealot, he was the radical, he was part of the radical Jewish, like, um, uh, his nationalist. Okay? And, and he would he would engage in criminal activity to bring down the Roman government. I mean, one of his goals as, as the zealot was he was engaging in politics, engaging in, in anarchy, so that he could uh, hopefully in, entice this this big revolution to come and overthrow the Roman Empire. I mean, he was like that dude. Give him a microphone, and everybody listened. We have a lot of those in our culture today. Some are nine years old. They have no idea what they're talking about, but they're talking. Everybody's listening. Why is that? I have no idea. It makes no sense to me. You know, and, and, and it's like, here's Simon the Zealot, and he's like, listen. And he tries to overthrow the government, and he's so one-sided. I mean, he's like a biblical terrorist, but he's chosen by Jesus. That's time to zealot. I don't know, you throw terrorists in somebody's name, and yeah, that's, that's pretty strong. That's what a zealot is. That's what Simon was. And Jesus 
to him and says, you are the worst of the worst enemies that I could ever have. It is you I want and it's you I choose. And maybe today you think that you're the worst enemy of God. You think you might be the one that's furthest away from God. And God says, you're my enemy, you're right. You're not worthy. But I stink it love you. And I choose you. When I read you, through Luke, I come down to Luke chapter 6, where he lists all of the disciples and how Jesus called them. You find Jesus praying for each one. And when he comes through and he prays for each one, because of the prayer, somebody like Simon the Zealot, he turns from anti everything to fully engaged with Jesus in the church. <laughs> anti-establishment to nothing matters but the church. He lives his life and serves Jesus that way. Then the last one, Judas. <laughs> What's Judas going for? Judas Iscariot. He's the traitor, right? He's the traitor of the group. He's the one that everybody knows betrays Jesus for a little bit of money in a pouch in his soul. He's the one that comes along in Matthew chapter 26. And we look at Judas in this upper room, part of the Last Supper, part of what's going on in the upper room. And I want us to see as we close what Judas is really all about here. When evening came, Matthew chapter 26, when evening came, Jesus was reclined at the table with the twelve. And while they were eating, Jesus says, truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. They were very sad and they began to... to talk and mutter amongst themselves, one after another, going to Jesus and saying, Surely you don't mean me, Lord. Verse 23, Jesus replied, The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. We're going to back to that. The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. Then the Son of Man will go on just as it, as it is written about him. But woe to the one who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him to have not even been born. Then Judas looked at Jesus. This is the one that would betray him and said, Surely you don't mean me, Rabbi. And Jesus answered, Well, you have said so. I want us to notice where Judas is at this moment. You see, Jesus, he picks 12 guys. Far from God. Far from, from, from knowing maybe what's right and wrong. Some are fishermen, they might be great guys. But from tax collectors to maybe some shady characters in, in the trades, maybe some you know, fishermen that are just common, maybe some are, are not you know, all that nice. But then you got Judas, and he's here. Judas, the traitor, get this, was invited by Jesus to be a team player. Which means that Judas the traitor was invited to this meal. Would you invite a traitor to your house? I mean, if I went political, Republicans, would you invite a Democrat? And vice versa. How about Nazarene? Would you invite a Mormon? How about Christian? Would you invite a Satanist? I mean, let's just be real. You, would you invite your coworker? No, we don't agree on a lot of things. Well, would you invite him? He says, so here's Judas. He's invited to this meal. Not only was he invited to this meal, you know what Jesus did with those 12? We read it earlier. He washed Judas's feet. Now Jesus knew that Judas was the one that was going to dip his hand in the bowl with him and betray him and start the process of the cross. When Judas comes up and knocks on that door, Jesus meets Judas with his towel and brings the bowl over and he kneels down next to Judas and he begins to wash Judas' feet. Isn't that beautiful? The traitor, Jesus still says, you're worthy. And even though all of this happens, Judas, when I look at this picture of these verses that we just read, Judas is reclined at the table of the Last Supper. 
just like he was one of the guys. Until, until Jesus says, one of you is not for me. See, my fear is that in today's Christianity, we all think that we're doing just great with Jesus. We're just one of the Christian happy people. And then when Jesus throws the gauntlet down and says, but there's one. We start to murmur and we start to muddle a little bit and we start to go, well, surely it's not me, it's got to be them. They said, oh, that's not the sanctuary. <laughs> Doesn't make you little people are safe. Okay? <laughs> but you see, Jesus sometimes comes alongside and goes, no, 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 listen. I'm washing all your feet because you're all worthy to be at my feet, at my table. You just got to pick up and know that the sacrifice I'm giving you is for you because I love you. Jesus could have picked any pick of the litter that he wanted, but he picked these 12 guys, these 12 mixed up guys. And because he picked these 12 mixed up guys, the gospel began to reach hundreds. And then it reached thousands until now today, in 2019, it spreads the world. All because Jesus picked 12 misfits. And you know what you are? You're one of those misfits. So am I myself. But I'm a misfit that's been chained to what Christ did on the cross. And I'm no longer a misfit. I am a found, redeemed, and accepted child of the King of Kings. And I have got to remember in those hard days when I want to just slap somebody silly. And you know what? That's the old self. My heart's got to say, Jesus chose me. I got to love him. And I just going like, Pastor, you think that? Listen, I'm no different than you. You think it too. You see, Jesus comes alongside and says, these guys, they like, span the church across the world. So just like the disciples in these stories, in these scriptures, Jesus himself today is offering to each one of us, no matter what our story, no matter how bad our story, no, no matter... Uh, what our temperament is, no matter how bad our past, and no matter how we're going to fail him in the future, Jesus is saying, you know what? Where you are in your life, you prayed earlier in this hour that you want me to do something in your life. I'm telling you what I want you to do in my day. I'm telling you what I want you to do. And some of you are thinking, I didn't really mean it. That's what you said, pray. As we learn today, there's power in prayer. So now it's up to you. What do you do with that? Because even at our worst, when we feel like we're unworthy, we are, we are still undeniably chosen by Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter how bad. So here's two questions I want to end with. Two questions. First one is this. Knowing that you're chosen, you're loved by God. Here's what I'd like you to spend the next week. So you can come next week and really celebrate in communion. I want to read it twice. I like to inspire you. No distraction. Jesus wants to work through me. The only question is, will I let him? Jesus wants to work through me. The only question is, Will I let him? It's a question we have to answer. I've laid out 12, only 12. There's much more. Only 12 examples for those that let him. So how are you going to answer that question? Jesus wants to work through me. The only question is, will I let him? Second question is this. If you're willing to let him, what am I willing to partner with God to do, both inside and outside of the church? If I allow him, what am I willing to partner with God to do, both inside and outside of the church? Because he doesn't just call us to sit and think and ponder. 55 years of Romans chapter 8 talk to us. 
How do you answer those questions? Let me read them to you. Jesus wants to work through me. And the only question is, will I let him? And what am I willing to partner with God to do, both inside and outside of the church? Father, today as we have these questions, as we leave today, just rattling around our hearts, we're going to post these this week as a constant reminder to answer the questions. Father, I pray that this week we are just going to be able to answer those questions going, yeah, okay, I, I am willing to let you. I now know that I can be used no matter who I am. You pick 12 dysfunctional misfits, I can be picked as well. I am chosen because I am loved by God. And because of that, I, I can find out what I'm willing to partner with God on. So I'm not called just to sit by. I'm called to move. I'm called to shake. I'm called to, to stir things up. I'm called to be light in the darkness, to know Jesus and to make him known, whatever that looks like. But how am I going to partner with God on that? Father, I thank you for the lessons of your disciples. Wow, just great guys with great hearts. When you change their hearts to follow you, they, they are, are great servants. They've given their lives for you. So, Father, I thank you for their testimonies. I thank you for their lives. I just thank you for how your word breathes life. And it breathes hope. And today, Lord, I thank you for such great examples to encourage me to let I can make it. That I can be chosen. That I can be loved by a God. That I can forget about my fears. And that I can understand that my fear has no power over me. Because of what you did on the cross by giving me your son to die for my sins. There we go. We're going to close this morning. If you prayed a prayer today that moved you closer to God, would you just raise your hand for it like that? Raise your hand for See those? Okay, good, good, good. One, come back, got those over here. This side, good. Okay. Anyone else? Good. Two in the back. Okay, middle, back sides. Good. Wow. God, that's testimony to you. Testimony to your word. So go, go, Lord, be with us. Lead us. Guide us. Use us. Make us what you want us to be, because Lord, we are ready for you to use us. We pray this in your name today. Everyone said, Amen. Amen. Hey, be praying for Pastor Michael and Claudia and Harper this week as they load that U-Haul and make that drive clean across the country. And they don't forget to go shopping. Let's love them next week. Thanks for being here.